Hey folks, I'm Mark Ryan. This is Super Review, and today we're gonna do a review of the Prisma Audio Azul. If you missed my first look unboxing video of this little IM a couple of weeks ago, there's some background that I think is worth knowing. So one, Prisma Audio. It's a brand new company out of Australia. Uh, and it's, I guess, more than just a company out of Australia. This is a company that's kind of fanborn, right? So the, the founder, the creator of the Azul, Joshua Sabo, he is a member of the audio community, uh, very actively engaged in Discord, and also full disclosure, like I'm friendly with him online, never met the guy in person, but um, he is a member of the audio community. And like a lot of people in the audio community, he you know had dreams about one day making an earphone or a headphone. There's a lot of people out there that kind of have that dream. But Joshua, he actually did it. So this is the Prisma Audio Azul. It's actually available. It's a retail product you can buy now. Link in the description down below. Um, and what it is, is it's a $300 earphone, a monitor. So it's got two balanced armatures and I guess not much more to say about it, except that the tuning that Josh went for, and, and you can check the, my unboxing video if you wanna see what that frequency response looks like, but the tuning that he went for, just kind of like a, a clean, neutral monitor, which surprisingly is not that common. Uh, but yeah, I've been spending the past couple of weeks living with the Azul, comparing it to some other earphones in the price range, especially the, the neutral kind of standards, which we'll talk about are gonna be like the Edemotic ER4XR and the Moondrop Blessing 2. Those are very, very well regarded I am. So the Azul is up against quite a bit, but we'll talk about it in this review. And like my other reviews, this is a live stream. So if you've got any questions about the Azul, hit me up in the live chat and I'm gonna do my best to ignore you guys for now, get through this review. And at the end of the review, we'll have a little back and forth conversation and hopefully I can get to answering any questions that I don't, but for now, Let's start with talking about the build of the Azul. And I guess like I normally do, I'll actually just start by talking about what you get inside the box as a quick recap. Um, and that's what you see out here. So my box actually got signed by Josh by special request. I don't think they all get signed by him, but maybe if you make it place an order uh, and ask for one, he'll sign yours as well. But anyway, um, obviously, you know, you get a set of tips, which is actually not just an ordinary set of tips. These are uh, Asla Sedna tips, which for folks that aren't familiar, this is one of the more well-regarded ear tips for audiophiles, just because it's got a nice wide bore. Um, I use these on actually a lot of my earphones. They don't come stock on any of my earphones except for the Azul. So that's actually pretty cool. And they come in a lot of different sizes. So this is actually six different sizes of tips. Uh, the ones that I'm using here on the Azul are actually the smalls. Uh, apart from that, you get one of these little carry cases to hold the earpieces independently. I'm actually not a big fan of these, so I didn't actually use this, but if you are concerned about protecting your uh, earphone investment, I guess you can go ahead and buy them yourself with something like that. This case, however, I think is actually um, more functional, at least for my taste, so just kind of like a nice faux leather. I did smell it, let's give it a... Yeah, it's not real leather, but it actually looks pretty convincing. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty nice case. The zipper on it's a little bit hard sometimes, but otherwise, you know, you got some nice soft materials in here and that is not too shabby. There you go, there's that hard zipper I mentioned. Um, the other thing that was actually kind of cool that the Azul comes with is this little metal placard. Uh, I don't know if he's planning on including these things with all of them, I hope he does, because this is actually pretty cool to get kind of like this little placard that tells you about um, about your Azul. Uh, and mine was actually unit number three. So not only is this a new company and the first I am from this new company, I've actually got the third version of it ever built, which frankly, I'm kind of excited about. Uh, well, let's go ahead and dive into the earphone itself. Let's start with the cable, which might not look like a lot, like it's just kind of an ordinary looking white cable, but it's actually a really nice cable. And you can see that behavior wise, like it's nice and soft. It doesn't, it's not stiff. It doesn't stand itself up or anything like that. It's just a really nice cable. And the fact that I've managed to tangle it up here on camera uh, should not indicate that it's a tangly cord because I think that's the first time I've tangled it. But yeah, very nice cable. And I'll give you a quick wind demonstration just to show you how well behaved this cable is. You know, it's a little bit on the thin side, but it doesn't, it actually feels pretty nice. And I'll punch in on it so that you can kind of see the texture 
in the cable, which has actually got this like almost cloth like texture, but it is wrapped in silicone. So um, it doesn't have any like kind of the, the microphonic issues that you might have on some cloth cables. And then we get to the earpieces themselves, which are a very unique shape. I haven't really seen anything like this. I think on the outer side, I believe this is like some sort of milled aluminum um, shell with a, a very brightly colored blue. I think this is actually pretty neat because there's not many earphones, honestly, that go for this bold of an aesthetic. Um, so there's that. And then on here on the inside, you've got, I think it's a 3D printed resin. Um, you can see the balanced armatures inside. It's not like the, the most crystal clear, but you can definitely see uh, the two BAs in here, as well as you can see the piping, the, uh, the, the internal tubing that makes up the acoustics. Um, let me take the tip off so you can see what the nozzle looks like. I mean, it looks like an earphone nozzle, but it does have um, a, a nice edge to it here that holds the tips on in place, and then it is covered with a small metal grill. Um, I mean, I think aesthetically it's a pretty nice looking earphone. Again, I quite like the cable. Uh, and let's do a quick fit demonstration as I talk about the fit, which I gotta say, this is a pretty comfortable earphone, but it's not my favorite fitting earphone. Um, primarily, it's just the shape of it is not super, super secure. I do find myself somewhat frequently, let's go ahead and zoom in on that. I do find myself somewhat frequently readjusting it if I'm like eating or I smile right? Smiling can sometimes like break the seal, which is not a totally uncommon thing. Um, some earphones can do a really good job of staying secure. And the Zool is just one of the ones that's, I would say it's about average in the security. But, uh, but yeah, comfort wise, I actually find it pretty comfortable and I'll show you why. And it's just basically because the only parts that touch your ear are going to be these all rounded edges. There's no sharp edges that touch my ear at least. Uh, maybe if your ear is cavernous, you might reach um, these, these outer screws, but I find that unlikely. All right, anything else I wanted to talk about, Bill? I don't think so. I think that is about as much as I could tell you about the physical aspects of the Azul. So we might as well jump in and talk about the sound signature, which I kind of already gave it away a little bit during the introduction. The, the tuning target that Joshua had for the Azul is kind of like a neutral monitor sound. Um, you can see the frequency response graph. It's just like, it's very flat. It's got some ear gain um, and it's got some pretty well extended treble. Uh, but yeah, that's basically the, the sound signature of this. And, and I'll, you know, there's various tunes of neutral. Neutral doesn't mean just one particular thing. Um, I would call this neutral kind of like a, a slightly dry, warm neutral. Um, someone in my in the, the initial unboxing suggested that it looked like a monitor, um, which again, there, there's sort of a difference between like just a neutral sound signature and then maybe a, a tune that's very good for monitoring specifically. And I actually do think that the, uh, the Azul uh, is tuned fairly well for specifically monitoring. Um, the the mid-range is a little bit on the warm side. It's got, you know, there's just not a ton of contrast between the lower mid-range and the upper mid-range. Um, like you might see in like something, I don't know, maybe like V-shaped signature or a little bit lean sounding. I don't think the Azul comes across as lean. Um, definitely not from the mid-range. Uh, and, and, and maybe despite that warm mid-range though, it is still kind of like a light and dry sound versus like a thick and rich sound. And I think a lot of that is going to have to do with the bass tuning, which we'll get to in more detail. But uh, this is this is not an IM for bass heads, if that's not clear. If you are a bass head, go somewhere else. Um, but if you're not a bass head, I, I think, well, again, we'll talk, we'll talk more about the bass in a bit. Uh, but yeah, I think just because of the bass tuning here, which is a little bit on the light side, um, think something like the Edemotic ER4XR in terms of strength of bass. Um, yeah, because of that, I, it, it can come across a little bit sort of on the light and dry side. So what I really like about the tuning here on the Azul, what I really like about the sound just generally is that tonally, I would call this kind of just very transparent sounding. Um, it is a mid-ranged focus tuning, which is generally what I like. Uh, if you've listened to, or if you watched my reviews in the past, you know, mid-range is typically what I, I will be the most critical of. And frankly, the mid-range here on the Azul uh, is just about ideal. 
I honestly don't have any complaints about the mid-range tuning. Um, the mid-range and the treble too, I would, I would describe as being very fast, which is a term that I don't use a ton, um, but I think it is definitely applicable here with the Azul. It's just the, the transient edges, sort of, sort of like the, the edges of sounds, right? With like guitar strings and plucks and stuff like that. Um, so that transient attack is just very fast and very sharp here on the Azul. Um, and that I think contributes to one of the things that I really like about this earphone is it's got really strong definition and detail. And that's part of why I would describe this as, as probably being pretty good for monitoring. Uh, although I don't do any monitoring, I just listen to music and I think it was pretty good for that as well. But um, yeah, it's just very strong. You know, I, I don't listen to a lot of bad music. Um, and maybe that goes without saying, nobody would say that they listen to bad music, but there's a chance that listening to, you know, some poorly mastered stuff, this might sound a little bit on the flat side because the tuning is so neutral, but I find that because the, uh, the attack on the treble and the mid range is so sharp that it actually lends to a very nice detail and texture, um, kind of across the board, like, you know, vocals that have texture in them, it's going to come through here, the pluck on guitar strings and stuff like that. It's going to come through very, very crystal clear here on the Azul. Um, you kind of get that detail and sort of the definite, well, not detail. You get kind of that definition that you might, um, that some other lesser manufacturers might go or try to achieve with like that V-shaped tuning. Um, you don't get a lot of detail typically out of a V-shaped tune. Whereas here you get that definition because of the speed of the BAs. Um, but in addition to it, you get just nice tuning all around. Um, and yeah, I, another thing also worth calling out is that the treble on the Azul is actually pretty well extended. Uh, you can see it in the frequency response graph. Not all earphones will have much in the way of a response past like 10,000 Hertz. Uh, but the Azul has actually got, got some, it's got some uh, SPLs above 15,000 Hertz, which is pretty impressive. So now that all sounds great. What are the things that maybe I don't love about the Prisma Azul? And these are things that, you know, might impact my enjoyment of it, but also just, I think, are, are things worth considering if you are out there shopping for an earphone and considering something like the Azul. So I do find that the treble on the Azul is a little bit on the fit, slightly fatiguing side. And a lot of it, I think, comes down to kind of like that lower treble region. If I, if I apply a, a parametric EQ, uh, you know, of like two decibels at 7,000 Hertz, it resolves any, any nit, you know, quibbles that I have about the treble here on the Azul. But out of the box, you know, I, I do think that it is a little bit, a little bit sharp there. It can give vocals a little bit of an edginess. Um, cymbals uh, can kind of have a little bit of a weightlessness or maybe a slight splashiness to the sound. Um, I don't think that it comes to the point where this is like a sibilant earphone. You know, it's maybe not the, the best at handling sibilance, but it's definitely not a, a bad monitor for sibilance. Um, and just, yeah, I think sibilance is typically a thing that's kind of in the recording and whether or not your earphone reveals it is, well, definitely up to the tuning. Here on the Azul, I think it will reveal some of the sibilance, but it's not an especially bad sibilance. Um, but yeah, I think that that treble tuning does give the Azul kind of that monitor feeling. And, and this is gonna be actually a bad uh, comparison, but if if you've heard this headphone, maybe it'll make sense. The, uh, the Sony MDR-V6, um, not a headphone that I like that much, frankly, but it does have this tuning in it that makes it, I don't know, it's just really good for monitoring the recording of vocals. And I don't, again, this is a bad comparison because I'm not trying to say that the Azul sounds like the MDR-V6, but uh, it does kind of have that same character to it, where just that lower treble is a little bit on the hot side, which can make it re really revealing in that area, uh, but also a tad fatiguing. Um, yeah, uh, other things maybe that are not the best here on the Azul, and I alluded to it a little bit before, is just the bass. And that's kind of what you expect. This is a two balanced armature earphone. There's no dynamic driver in here. So the bass that you're gonna get is balanced armature bass. That's one. Uh, but also, you know, it, there's no big woofer um, BA in here. It's, it's I believe um, the, the BAs in here are more tuned for the mid range and the treble. And of course you get some bass uh, and it's actually pretty level and flat tuned bass. The, the tuning on the bass I actually think is about ideal for my preferences, but 
just because it's a balanced armature. It doesn't have quite that weight and that punch that you might get in another earphone. I think that it, the bass that's here does lend it sufficient depth, but if it had a stronger bass performance, I do think that it would really add a lot to this earphone. Uh, and then the last thing that I'll mention is that staging and imaging are actually not bad on the, uh, the Azul at all. Um, in fact, I think those are things I probably could have talked about in, the, in the, the, the pros, but they're not necessarily stand out here on the Azul either. Um, it does you know, a pretty good job of sounding three-dimensional, and I think more three-dimensional than something like the Edemotic ER4. Um, but you know, I think not having that dynamic driver base uh, to support it does just mean that it doesn't have the deepest sound. So with that reference, let's go ahead and bring in the Edemotic ER4 and talk about these two a little bit more in comparison. So this is kind of like the pre-existing neutral reference monitor um, that I reviewed a while back. I like this earphone a lot, although I don't listen to it a lot myself personally, just because like I kind of alluded to, it can sound a little bit on the two dimensional side, um, but they do have, I think, pretty similar targets. They're both going for neutral. Uh, I think if you look at these actually from like 1000 Hertz and below, they almost look exactly the same in their frequency response, kind of a warm neutral tune. Um, but above that, there's a little bit more pin again here on the ER4, which just means that vocals come forward a little bit more. Uh, and then the treble doesn't extend as much on the, the ER4. And generally, I think the treble is not as spicy here on the ER4. In fact, the treble honestly is like, that's one of the things that makes this earphone so good is the treble. The treble response is just, I have almost zero complaints about it. I wish it maybe extended a little bit better, uh, but almost zero complaints about the treble here. Whereas here again, it can be a little bit in the fatiguing side, um, but there is you know, the advantage of that treble extension. Um, I think in terms of sort of like detail perception and speed, the, the Azul actually, outperforms the ER4 and maybe part of that is that it's got two balanced armatures but you know it, it's definitely more than just the count of BAs. Um, yeah I think based on them again pretty similar but the 3D feel the 3D effect that you get on these earphones I do think is significantly stronger here on the Prisma Azul than it is on the ER4. So move that aside and bring in the most challenging challenger which of course is the Moondrop Blessing 2. This is the earphone that for me basically unseated the Edemotic ER4 as sort of my neutral reference. Now, uh, bass-wise, this has a little bit more bass than the ER4, um, certainly in SPL and in, in terms of how it shows up on a frequency response, but the big difference is that this is a, a hybrid earphone, right? This has got a, a dynamic driver in there handling the low end whereas the Azul and the Edemotic are both uh, just all balanced armatures. So let's just talk about the tuning though. So kind of like the Edemotic, I think the, the vocal tuning here on the Blessing 2 is a little bit more forward than it is on the Azul. Um, I think overall the, the Blessing 2 gives a, a smoother overall presentation. I do think that it also presents wider um, and with stronger depth probably in part due to the tuning, uh, which is not quite as hot and, well, actually, they're actually both a little bit hot in the lower treble. So maybe it's more to do with the, uh, the, the treble extension, which is stronger here on the, the Azul. Um, but I do find that this just kind of comes across a little bit, a little bit smoother and a little bit more laid back listening. Not that this is necessarily the most laid back earphone, but that is a comparison. Um, let's see, anything else I wanted to talk about? I mean, I did find that the, the treble, you know, despite it being, uh, I would say overall a little bit spicier and maybe a tad more fatiguing here on the Azul, the treble on the Blessing 2, I think can get tripped up sometimes in a way that it doesn't happen here on the Azul and definitely never happens on the ER4. Um, it just, it can come across a little bit sharp and sort of, it, which seems like the mid treble region. Um, but yeah, I think honestly the, the, the real big difference is going to be in that, that bass presentation, which on the Blessing 2 is just about my ideal perfect bass. It's not a lot of bass, uh, but it's the difference between having a dynamic driver and not having that dynamic driver. It just gives a lot more body and sort of a physical character to the bass that adds to that depth of sound, right? It makes the sound not just sound sort of wide in this sense, but also 
sort of deep front to back. Um, whereas here on the Azul, it's got, I think, pretty decent bass tuning for, for what it is, but it's not going to give you that same effect. Um, overall, I would say that this is kind of just the smoother listen. This is kind of a, an, an easier all-arounder, whereas the Azul might actually be a little bit more on the revealing side, a little bit more on the analytical, slightly less musical side. And I think that's going to do it for my review of the Prisma Audio Azul. Like I always do, I got to give this thing a rating. So out of five stars, I'm going to go ahead and give the Azul a very, very solid four stars. I think this thing is, is pretty good. And honestly, like I'm really, I'm really satisfied with this. This is an earphone I've been looking forward to for a long time. I'm not really sure how it would turn out. And it's pretty crazy. It's, it's what, April now, 2021. I'm listening to the Prisma Audio Azul and it's legit. Uh, so yeah, that is the Prisma Audio Azul. If you're interested in checking this thing out, of course, I got a link in the description down below. Warning, it's priced in Australian dollars. They're a little bit, they're a little bit cheaper than American dollars. So it's cheaper than it looks. Um, but yeah, if you like this video, if you found it helpful, please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and ding the YouTube bell, and I'll see you on the next Super Review. All right, live stream crew. Let me get myself sorted out and catch up with the live chat. How's it going? It's Saturday evening almost. It's almost 5 p.m. here. Got a cat walking around outside. You know, Saturday things. How's your weekend so far? Let me, uh, let me catch up with the live chat and see if we've got any open questions I can get to. Big Boss, how's it going? Welcome. Zombie Snail, welcome to the stream. Zenboy2000, how's it going? War Samir, welcome. DNTR, howdy. Kieran, what's up in New York? Hopefully that burrito was good. Bunker Buster, nice to see you. Glad you can make it. Ooh, Elazar asking, I wonder how it compares to the BGVP DM8. So I didn't do any head to head comparisons with the DM8, but I have listened to the DM8 recently enough that I could definitely give some kind of um, off the cuff comparisons. I would say that the DM8 is going to be. Um, the tuning, I think, is, is stronger here on the, the Azul, although the, the DMA is probably a little bit smoother in the treble, um, a little bit more relaxing of a listen. I think they're both kind of versions of neutral, uh, despite the fact that the DMA looks like it's bassy. I don't really find that it comes across bassy. Um, but yeah, I would say that the DMA is a more laid back version of neutral, whereas here this is a little bit on the assertive side. What's up, Roy? Sai, how's it going? My Life Matter, what's up? Welcome. Night Quaker, how's it going? Christos in Greece, what's up? Zaid, don't don't take don't take a offense to the the this isn't for bass heads. I mean, if you're a bass head and you want to try it out, of course you can listen to it, but. Um, I don't think you're going to be satisfied if you're expecting a lot of bass. I don't think you're going to be satisfied with bass uh, with any of the three earphones that I've kind of brought up here. These are, there's nothing wrong with being a bass head. I'm just not one. Gusta asking about costs. So the, uh, the Prisma Audio Azul is $400 Australian, which works out to be about $300 US. Juan, how's it going? Yo, that was a lot of, that's a lot of oats. I like seeing people trying to predict the number of stars in the rating before the review. I want to see more of that. You guys should take bets in the crowd. Um, let's do some illegal stuff. Uh, 
son of Hallhorse saying, looking forward to my Azul arriving. Neutral isn't usually my favorite tuning, but it's good to have a set around and I like supporting someone from the community, new company's efforts. Yeah, that was honestly like why um, I initially bought in on the Azul. So when Josh put up the pre-orders like back in November, maybe October, I can't remember how long ago it was. Um, you know, I, I had talked with actually Juan, who's in the chat right now. I had talked with him about this company. I'd never heard of him before. And I just like the idea of it. I love the idea of someone that's in the audio community, uh, wanting to make an earphone, wanting to make a headphone, going out there, actually doing it, putting up for sale, really putting themselves out there. Um, and I was interested, you know, I just wanted to support that. Now, that said, I didn't know a lot about Josh. I didn't really know if I was gonna expect something that actually sounded that good. So now here in April, it's nice to finally have confirmation that yeah, it's, it's legit. Uh, my life matter. I'm curious what you're, what you're referring to, and you're saying uh, you get two sets of Duno EST 112 for that price. EST is like almost 500 bucks. Zaid, is the camera focus a bit derpy today? I don't know. Let's see. Let's punch in over here. Uh, I can say one difference today is that um, there's probably more lighting in here than usual. I've actually got my windows open. Um, usually I shade them for the, for the reviews or for the videos, but it's a little bit overcast and I was feeling lazy, but it does mean that there's going to be more light in here. And so down here, this is going to be brighter than typical. Hopefully not too bad. Big Boss asking, when I say that the Azul is more revealing than the Blessing 2, is that in comparison of detail retrieval as well? Yeah, I mean, I think that's what I mean really, is like, um, and I think it has to do with kind of like that sharp edge on the lower treble. It can give the sense that, you know, again, things like guitar string plucks, um, or even like the, the edginess of vocals, like you might, I don't, I don't know how my microphone is picking it up, but like there's sort of like that, um, I, I'm not, I'm not a scientist, but uh, that sort of like edginess that can come from, you know, vibration down here. Uh, that's a little bit different than just the, the rest of the vocal aspect. Anyway, that, that aspect of, of vocals and, um, and guitar strings and like sort of like the finger, the finger feel on uh, instruments and stuff like that. I do feel like it gets a little bit accentuated here on the Azul, whereas on the Blessing 2, it's maybe a little bit I don't know, it's it's definitely all there. Like, I don't wanna suggest that you can hear things on this that you can't hear on the Blessing 2. That's not usually what I mean when I'm talking about detail. It's just more about, does it stand out to you? And I think that the tuning here of the treble, and I think part of it, I was actually talking with Josh about this a little bit uh, when I was getting, giving him some feedback about the earphone. Um, there, everything in a frequency response is kind of like relative to everything else, right? So if you take two frequency responses that look mostly the same, but one of them has, you know, let's say the bass sunk out and there's no bass. Um, it's not just gonna sound just like the other earphone, but without bass, it's gonna sound like brighter. It's gonna sound like the treble in the upper mid range has actually got more emphasis because it doesn't have the bass in the low end to kind of counterbalance it. And I do think that effect is happening a little bit here with the Azul, whereas, um, you know, the lower treble isn't necessarily, like it's not, super elevated, but I don't think that the upper mid range is as forward as you get on something like the Etymotic or the Blessing 2 and that sort of lack of contrast, I think helps it stand out for better or worse, depending on what you're looking for. Uh, son of Hall Horse asking, did I try any other tips or I know I just stuck with the, uh, the included Aslas. Um, I might actually, I'll probably swap them out for, uh, I've got the Asla Zelastec tips, um, because they're going to have the same bore size. And I've also got some smalls in that, 
uh, but that extra like grippiness I think will help with the, the fit security that I talked about. Rommel asking for the best IMs under 200 bucks. I'm actually gonna suggest Rommel. I mean, I've got a couple of preferences, you know, things like the Mago SEK5 I still really like, um, the Tanch Jamhana, File FH3, um, Etimotiki R2XR, there's a handful, but like what you like amongst those is, I can't predict. So my best recommendation is to check out the channel, go to the playlists tab. And I've actually got a playlist of my five favorite picks under 200 bucks. Uh, and you can watch those videos and kind of get a sense for each one and, and make a decision for which one uh, you think will apply to you. And then Ramat asking me in the range of $700, what's my favorite earphone? Um, I mean, I do have a single favorite at that price and it's currently the Moondrop S8. Umar asking, does it need a cable upgrade? In my opinion, no. I think the cable here on the, uh, on the Azul is actually a really nice cable. Um, if you're asking about like, does it need a cable upgrade for sound? No, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't change my cables for sound. I just change them for sort of either aesthetic or handling characteristics. And I think that the aesthetic and handling characteristics of this cable, actually pretty good. Sick Tomas, how's it going? I apologize if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. Adam Mobius asking, do I prefer the ER2 to the ER4? And the answer is yes, I actually do. I think, the, I mean, I think the ER4, um, like I talked about the treble tuning or the treble on the ER4 being like really pretty standout. And like, I can't, I prefer the tuning on the, on the sorry, I prefer the treble on the ER4, but the rest of it, I actually do prefer on the ER2 XR. It just gives you a stronger sense of depth, a little bit more of a 3D feel. Um, it's not like an imaging monster or anything like that, but uh, that dynamic driver in the ER2, I do think just makes it more of a satisfying actual listen, music listening experience than the ER4. I see some questions about Shure's. The only Shure that I think I've heard two different Shure earphones. I've heard the Shure SE215. And I've also heard the Shure KSE1200, I believe. Uh, it's a, an electrostatic earphone with this like crazy, uh, crazy pack that you have to have it attached to. Um, that thing sounded like, from what I remember, just like kind of insane detail, but the treble on it was way too sharp. Like that was, I talked about sibilance earlier. That was an earphone that accentuated sibilance, at least for my ear. Oh, my life matter. I see you, you, you were working under the impression that the EST-112 is 160. That would be nice, man, if the EST-112, was 160. Antic, you want me to suggest you a non-fatiguing and a warm I am. Um, I mean, one I've been listening to lately that you might, you might want to check out is the Final Audio B3. I think, that, I think that definitely counts as non-fatiguing. Uh, or the Dunu EST-112, honestly. That's probably a better pick. Yeah, My Life Matter, you're saying the BGVP NS9 is around 160 bucks and it's got plenty of drivers. I've actually got it sitting in a box over here. I gotta unbox it soon. I gotta get through a bunch of reviews though. So that one will be coming soon. I've been actually thinking about, so I'm getting a bit of a backlog uh, and I was thinking about doing, would people be interested in watching this? Just kind of like a more casual stream or maybe I'm sitting at my table here rather than standing here and talking to you directly. and just like a 
maybe just like a couple of hours of me sitting around uh, unboxing earphones, measuring them, throwing them up into Squiglink for comparisons and like, I don't know, it would be a much different video than these, but would be, people be interested in that? Big Boss, glad to hear. Zaid, you're asking about a video about my filming setup. I could do something like that. I mean, it's not like that fancy, but um, honestly, all, all of my setup has kind of been around reducing friction for myself because setting up video equipment is just not that much fun. I mean, it's kind of like fun to figure things out, but once you figure things out, taking it, tearing it down and putting it back up and tearing it down and putting it back up is not a lot of fun. So a lot of what I've done with my studio setup here is just kind of set myself up to do easily repeatable things that don't require that sort of that tedious aspect of it. Blue collar here out hero asking, that's those words. Uh, good talking to you again. Have you tried Empire Ears or 64 Audio IM? So, yes, I have. Uh, I'm trying to remember. I think I've only heard one Empire Ears. It was the Odin. Um, and I only heard it for a little bit, honestly. So take my impressions with a grain of salt. But I found it pretty impressive in terms of technical performance. But I didn't really like the tuning. Um, it seemed a little bit V-shaped for, for my, my tastes. Uh, but 64 audio stuff, I have also heard a handful of those IMs. In fact, I've got a box over here with one, two, three, four, five different 64 audio IMs that I got to spend a lot of time with uh, and do sort of, I'm probably planning on doing like a wrap up or a roundup review of those. Now, the one that I've spent the most time with of this bunch is probably the U12T, which I like quite a bit. Um, but I've also got the Neo here and I'm interested to see if maybe I actually, there's a chance I might like the Neo a little bit better, but we'll see. I feel like the U12T, I like it better with one of the, probably like the M15 module in it, which gives it more bass than I typically like, but because it's a balanced armature, it's not, it's not overwhelming. I did feel like the Neo with the M15 module was a little bit overwhelming for me, but then I heard it with the M10 module, which is less bass. And I like that quite a bit. So do I like that more than the U12T? That's what I'll figure out when I'm finally able to spend some more time with those. Sick Tomas, you're Hungarian. Okay. I'm glad, I'm glad I didn't, I didn't murder your name at least. Um, Although maybe I, maybe knowing that it's Hungarian, I'm trying to remember, I think the only other Hungarian name I'm familiar with, and I think, I think it was a Hungarian name, was the editor in chief of Car and Driver magazine back in probably the nineties, showing my age here, but his name was C-S-E-R-E, -E, right? No, that was his last name, I think. Well, I can't even remember. That was one of his names. They were both pretty similar. Um, and the way that, that, that like people said that his name was pronounced in the magazine, which is only, that's, those are words. I have to read it. Um, but like the whole time I, I had assumed his name was like Sabacer, but then someone in the magazine referred to him as Chabacheta. So I'm guessing there's something in between there that is the, per, the correct pronunciation. Grant Patala, uh, got the KPH-30i clear. They're so good. For some reason, they sound better than the old ones I had. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have heard of some unit variants with the KPH-30i's. Uh, I'm not sure what that's about. I can say I've had three different sets. They all sound pretty good. And I no obvious differences to me, although um, I did measure a slight difference in the treble with the clear version. All right, see, people seem to be into the casual stream. I might do that. It'd probably be in the middle of the week, middle of the day, at least middle of the day, um, California time. We'll keep it casual. Uh, 
Uh, H Payman asking, am I, am I going to review more over-ear headphones? Nothing, um, nothing coming up, nothing on the books. And in fact, I've got a bunch of IMs in the backlog. So it'll probably be a while before I get to an over-ear headphone. Although uh, my next video I think is gonna be about the Drop Panda, kind of like a follow-up on talking about a couple of things. One, um, there've been some new developments with the Drop Panda. One, the, the app that they had talked about coming out that has built-in parametric EQ. That app is now available and I've spent some time playing with it. Wanted to talk about that in video. Uh, but they've also released a, a, just like a whole collection of alternate pads directly from Drop. They've got like a sheepskin pad, a fenestrated pad, they've got a velour pad and then a hybrid pad. Um, and Drop actually sent me a set of each of those pads and I've spent some time listening to them. Um, so I wanted to do a video kind of talk about just getting the most out of the Panda, um, getting the tuning where you like it or where I like it. I don't know where you like it, but um, that'll probably be, I mean, that's gonna be coming up soon. Um, might be my next video and I'll probably be the last over ear headphone video for at least a couple of months. Lorvald asking or saying, I saw your review of the Shozi Neo CP from a while back. Would I still recommend it? Um, that's a very good question. I unfortunately, I broke my CP. Um, I like, I remember I was, I think I was wearing it to sleep. And then like I typically do in the middle of the night, I put it on my nightstand. And then when I woke up in the morning, I accidentally, like I was a little groggy. I picked it up in a way in which I basically just pulled it off my nightstand and it swung and smacked into the side of my bed, which is just hard wood. And ever since then, I think it's the left side doesn't work anymore. Um, so it's been over a year since I've heard the show CP and I, I, I don't know if I would still love it. Um, I can say for sure that was definitely one of the best fitting IMs I've ever had. Um, tuning wise, if I look at it on a frequency response, I can see things that might bug me now, but as I remember it, I, I, I think I would still like it. And I, I'm honestly still tempted uh, to buy another one, even though I've got way too many earphones. And that's why I haven't bought another one, but I'm still kind of tempted to, even though I don't need it. Just because it fits so good and sound, it sounded very solid. Zeus asking, there's a bad bright sound, but there's a bad warm sound. Um, I don't know if you're, at, maybe you're asking for clarification on the terms bright and warm and how they're kind of used in contrast. I don't, I don't view bright and warm as um, on a scale of like good to bad or bad to good. Like warm for me is not necessarily good and it's not necessarily bad and bright is not necessarily good and not necessarily bad. They're just like different flavors. Um, my general tuning preference is actually for a little bit more on the brighter side. Um, although I like a warm mid range. And so this is also where the term warm can kind of be used to describe a couple of things. A lot of times people will talk about warm as like kind of like a bass dominant sound, um, can give a warm sound to the rest of the frequency response. Um, for me, I use warm more to describe kind of like the contrast between upper mid range and lower mid range. If you've got something with um, a lot of upper mid range and like really thin lower mid range, you, you don't have it like that's a non warm sound to me. Like thin and warm are kind of like opposites to me, more than bright and warm, if that makes sense. Night Quaker, have a, have a good sleep. Is that a thing people say? I just did it. Blue Collar Hero, you remember Chubba Chetta as well. Thank you, that is how that is how it was spelled, yes. I remember the last name spelling, I forgot the first name. Rob Hawk asking, will there be an iOS app too? I assume you're talking about the, um, the Drop Panda. I haven't actually looked into it. I, I assumed that the app already was available for iOS, but you asking that question, maybe maybe it's not the case. I've been using it on Android because even though I am primarily an iPhone guy, here's my iPhone, 
Um, when I'm listening to music on a, a phone, I, I use Android. So the phone that I use to interface with my Drop Panda is an Android device. Um, I'll try to look into that and get, get an answer on that before I do my video. Zaire, or Zaid, you remember the, you remember Micromatic. Uh, it's probably not gonna come back, unfortunately. Um, I just don't do that much photography lately, or if I do photography, it's with the phone. Uh, Ramat, you're asking File FH7, iBaso, IT07, or Moondrop S8. Well, the only one that I've heard of those three is the Moondrop S8, so I'm gonna say go with the Moondrop S8, but I haven't heard the other one, so that's probably not the best advice. But yeah, um, it's Saturday. I got to do some dishes, cook some dinner, get things done. So I really appreciate y'all hanging out, asking the questions, having the chat, giving me some information that I didn't have. And uh, yeah, really appreciate it. Thanks for watching. And if you haven't already, please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, ding the bell, etc. And then I'll see you in the next Super Review. Have a good weekend, folks.